Speaker. Good it's a pleasure to follow the Honourable Member for Bolton South East. Mr Speaker, I want to suggest that today's budget was a very significant uh, historic budget for this country. Twelve months before a crucial general election, it gave the British people a very clear choice. It showed through the OBR report the success of the last three years, four years' work rebalancing, laying the foundations for long-term growth. It showed us a Chancellor and a Government committed to the long-term programme of recovery on which we have embarked, and it was a budget for resilience, responsibility and the real economy. And in particular, Mr. Speaker, I wanted to highlight three elements. Uh, the first is the extent to which we have finally begun to get on top of the appalling historic debt legacy that we inherited from the party opposite, the very significant steps that we have set out to support science, uh, innovation and export-led growth, and thirdly, the historic package of support for savers and pensioners. I'd be delighted to give way. Will he, have, will he have time to add as a fourth point the Cambridge City deal, which will contribute to so much of what he's saying will help his constituents as well as mine? Yes, I'm delighted that the Chancellor has been able to support the Cambridge City deal, which will play a key part in that innovation economy. Mr Speaker, I, I think we should take this time to remember the mess we inherited four years ago and, indeed, the causes of it. The truth is that between 1997 and 2010, we saw the largest increase in public spending as a percentage of national income of any industrialised country. From 1997 to 2010, we rose from 22nd in the World uh, League table for, for uh, public spending as a percentage to 6th. And before, or indeed after, members opposite try and argue that this was a result of the global crash, if you take the date of 2007, before the crash, we had risen from 22nd to 10th. It was the second largest increase in history. That legacy was created by a willful overspend by the party opposite, and it left us in 2010 with the biggest uh, peacetime budget deficit in our history, a £157 billion deficit and a £1 trillion debt. Mr Speaker, if you pay off that debt, at a million pounds a minute. It takes you 30 years to pay off a debt of that level, and the truth is everybody in this country is now paying for it. We inherited a situation in which debt interest alone, the interest on the debt, was set to rise to 70 billion a year. Debt interest alone, when we started, was the fourth biggest department of state. We were borrowing a pound for every four pounds in government. And for the Chief Secretary of the outgoing party opposite to leave a note with an exclamation mark saying he thought it was funny there was no money left is an absolute disgrace and we should remember it. I don't think it's a joke because we're all paying the price. And that's why I welcome today the Chancellor's announcement of the progress and the OBR's uh, 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 um, reporting on the progress that we're making uh, in our deficit reduction plan. The 80-20 rule, 80 per cent from spending and 20 per cent from tax. Tough decisions, all we should remember, opposed by the party opposite, which are now beginning to lead to really sustained long-term growth. Growth now up at the highest level for 30 years. We're now the fastest growing economy in the G8. 1.5 million jobs created, three to one for every job uh, regrettably lost in the public sector. A 24 per cent fall in unemployment. The fastest fall in youth unemployment for 20 years as a result of which we are now on track to eradicate the deficit by 2018, and we are paying off debt quicker than any other Western economy. That is a record of which we should be proud, and it is a record that this Budget stands testament to. I wanted uh, to then highlight the really important work that the Government is doing off the back of that platform to support our innovation economy, the announcements today on science and technology and the knowledge economy, the £42 million for the Alan Turing Institute of Big Data, in which Britain is really leading the world, the £74 million for the Cell Therapy Manufacturing Centre and the Graphene Innovation Centre, putting Britain at the cutting edge of new technologies that will turbocharge uh, new industries and new business creation, and the £106 million for the 20 doctoral training centres across the country. Mr Speaker, we uh, face an enormous opportunity to trade our way out of this debt crisis by plugging into the fastest growing emerging, emerging markets around the world, in particularly the life sciences, in food, in medicine, in energy. Those economies are going to go in 30 years through an industrial and agricultural revolution we started and went through in 300, and they represent vast markets for our knowledge economy. And that's why I particularly support the support for export finance. As a trade envoy and a former businessman myself, I know how important it is to support our small companies. We're coming off a woefully and shamefully low base. Thirteen years the party opposite left us. Very, very 
uh, weekly linked into those emerging markets. We still export more to Luxembourg and Belgium than we do to China, but I'm delighted that the government is making such progress. And Mr Speaker, you don't need to take it from me, take it from the business community. The Director General of the CBI said this was a responsible and an imaginative budget which should promote growth, exports and investments. It will be widely welcomed across the business community. The British Chamber of Commerce this afternoon said it was disciplined, focused and geared towards the creation of wealth and jobs, and it passes the business test. And the CBI have said it was a budget that will put wind in the sails of business investment, especially in manufacturing. And Mr Speaker, I wanted thirdly to turn to the really historic announcements on savings and pensioners the pensioner bond, the new ISA, uh, abolishing the 10p rate on savings, the child trust fund, the junior ISA uh, uh, increase of the amount that can be invested. Given we, <coughs> isn't that a problem quite often with the governance of ISAs, when the banks attract savers into ISAs and then change the rules and the boundaries of ISA within a year and no longer selling that, but move on to the next ISA pot, and that sometimes sa savers are being perhaps ripped off by banks when, when banks haven't been responsible and managing their ISAs properly by, by moving the vehicle by which that money is in and lowering the interest rate after a year or two. He makes an interesting point. That I think the bigger point is that in the 1980s, this party launched a historic renaissance of saving and uh, wealth uh, uh, creation, and more and more people through the ISAs and the PEPs were able to own shares and save. That was uh, willfully uh, destroyed by the uh, former uh, Prime Minister of the party opposite the Honourable Member for Kerkoddy through his stealth taxes. Uh, and it's long, um, uh, long been needed that we restore a culture uh, and a set of incentives in this country for, the, uh, for a genuine renaissance of savings, which is key to the resilience that the Chancellor set out today. And I thought that was really the most important set of measures in today's budget, which will stand the test of time. Well, what did we hear from the party opposite? I came today genuinely uh, wanting to hear the opposition's response to this package. I wanted to hear the alternative economic policy that the party opposite are going to put to the British people next spring. And you know, Mr Speaker, for all the noise you hear on this side of the House, the real test in this House, as we know, is the silence you hear on the benches opposite. What we heard today was an embarrassing descent into business bashing, class war, and if that's what the Honourable Member opposite defines as his new socialism, I wish him luck. I will be sending a copy of that speech to all the businesses in my constituency because it fails the business test in spades, and it's the business test that will drive the growth and the investment that the public sector always depends on. The, tr the truth... I'll be delighted to give away. For, for, for giving away, but will he also be sending um, a copy of the noise that was being generated by members on his benches yeah. during the op uh, opposition leader's speech today? Well, I'll have a chance to read in Hansard. I'm not surprised there was noise. It was a shameful performance at a time when, 12 months from the election, this country needs a choice. Uh, and Her Majesty's opposition are supposed to set out an alternative economic policy. It was, I'm afraid, woeful. It gives me no pleasure to say it. And the result is that the choice is now very clear. A Chancellor and a Government and a Prime Minister with a long-term plan for resilience, for recovery, led by the real economy and investment, and a leader of the opposition who seems now committed to simply going into the election on a ticket of partisan politics and uh, gesturing to his trade union funders. It was not a budget response that merited that title. It didn't set out a serious economic uh, uh, programme for recovery, and I'm afraid it deserves the response that I think it will get at next year's general election. Mr David Lammy. Mr Speaker, I'm very grateful to have the opportunity to speak in this budget debate. Can I begin by welcoming the Chancellor's announcement on new housing developments at Brent Cross and Barking Riverside, and also the overground extension at Barking. This is well needed 